travel. Yes. Twenty one. No, no. Let's uh, let's pray, shall we? Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to to read and consider a section from your book that you have given. We thank you for the reminder that you are a good God and you have given us your word, the Bible. We pray that we might read it, read it for ourselves, we might hear it read to us, and that we might ponder over it. And we do pray that there might be some truths in it this morning that are relevant to our situations. And we pray that uh, you would speak to us uh, from the Bible. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, sh oh, sh okay. We're all aware that it's New Year, 1st of January. And um, yeah, a new year, a new start, a new opportunity. When I think about New Year and the new start and the new opportunity, I, I often think about a a new book at school, a new exercise book. Do you remember exercise books in school, some of you? I can just about remember mine. And um, yeah, it got very messy towards the end. I was glad when I was given a new book. The only consolation was, I think, in the old book, the teacher showed how much she liked me by putting kisses all the way through the book. It was really good. She was really kind. But a new book, unspoiled by the mistakes, opportunity to start again with a new book and your best writing. And oh, how careful you were on that first page. Second page was slightly different and, and so on. But in the new year, it isn't really a, a clean start, is it? We bring our joys into the new year that we had last year. We... Uh, had real blessings from the Lord. I'm sure the Lever family can tell us about their dog, Bonnie. Just been to the vets, but apart from that, I think she's all right. But yeah, great joy of having a new puppy. Great joys come into the new year as well. Bonnie's still around, thankfully. But we bring our scars as well, don't we? We bring those things that are maybe physical scars that we have, Things that are mental scars that we have, emotional scars, and the things that pain us as we look back over the previous year or previous years. We bring our griefs, we bring our pains. It's not a completely fresh start, is it, in the new year? But it is a time when people make New Year resolutions. Uh, I think I've given up on that a long time ago, but uh, people do make them, don't they? And it's usually what they're going to give up for the new year, which doesn't necessarily last very long. They'll lose some weight or put some weight on, whatever their condition might be. Eat more healthily. Start something new. And yeah, all good intentions, but how often do we fail to keep them? Making plans for the new year. Yeah, nothing wrong with making plans. In fact, John and I have penciled some things in for the, for the new year. We've inked in some others. And uh, yeah, it is good to, to make plans. To have things to look forward to. And uh, often we don't plan and it doesn't happen. So it's good to make plans to do certain things. But what does it say in James about us making our plans? He has some truth that we need to take heed of. James says there in James 4, Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will do this, or uh, go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, says James, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. 
Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag. All such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. Yeah, it's good to make plans, but it's good to make plans that are in the Lord's will, isn't it? As Christians, those who love the Lord Jesus Christ as our saviour, ought to be asking, what does the Lord want us to do in this new year? What is his will for us? So, what does the Lord want us to do? I think this passage in uh, Deuteronomy that we've been uh, looking at is, is brilliant. It's a brilliant answer to that question. What does the Lord want us to do? It's already in uh, my Bible. I'm a Bible underliner. I, I don't know whether that offends any of you here, but I certainly underline verses. And uh, that was underlined in uh, my Bible from a long time ago. And I came across it just recently and it spoke to me and I thought, I, I need to look at that. There's a lot of truth in, uh, in that uh, section. And it seemed to hit me afresh. And I thought I'd share it with you this morning. So let's have a look at it in a bit more detail. It's uh, Deuteronomy chapter 10, 10 and verses 12 and 13, which are, are there. Deuteronomy, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible written by Moses. Yeah, written by Moses and De Deut called the Pentateuch, five books. Pentateuch, Pent being five. And Deuteronomy is a, an amplification of the, the law given in Exodus and Leviticus. It's not a second law, but it's an additional explanation and amplification of that law. Here in chapter 10, we have a section, what does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord ask of you in verse 12 there? And we do well to consider it for today. This section follows, as we read in the Bible, the giving of the law for the second time. You remember Moses was given the uh, Ten Commandments once and he got down and found the people had uh, sinned grossly and the tablets were broken. This is the second time he's been for the book of the law, for the Ten Commandments, and uh, he's now brought them down and asking this question, what does the Lord, your God, ask of you? And we need to look at the sentence structure, if you don't mind. Start of this year, what does the Lord ask of you? Verses 12 and 13, fear the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God, and to observe his commands and his decrees listed out there as they are in the Bible. But Bible text often uh, is not like English text. If I get a, a book and um, I wonder what it's about, how it's going to end up, where do you go? You go to the back page, don't you, and read it there. That's cheating. We used to do that in, in industry. I used to get a wadge of mail every day. And uh, there was no way you could read a pile of reports. You'd read the front page and you'd go to the back and you'd read the conclusions and you knew what it was and it was in your mind. You couldn't read it all. Here in the um, Hebrew text structure, they use what they called chiasm, chiastic structure. That means excuse me for explaining uh, this, I had to look it up, but it was Joan that pointed it out to me on these verses some time ago. The most important thing is not at the end or the beginning, it's in the middle. And so you can see there, there are five things that we're looking at. What's the most important one? Number three, to love him. 
Yeah. So we've got here, we've got um, one and five together. We've got three and four together. And we've got one in the middle. So if we put them together like this. Fear the Lord your God, to keep his commandments, to walk in his ways, and to serve the Lord your God. What do we end up with on the top? To love him. Yeah, so you can see it's reaching a pinnacle there. And I want us to go through in layers, the yellow, the green, and the, the yellow. Fear of the Lord is to keep his commands and decrees in uh, verses 12 and 13. To fear the Lord, whatever it is, is to be cultivated. It tells us in uh, Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We need to cultivate knowing the Lord to become wise in his ways. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What is this fear of the Lord? Well, I don't know how to start explaining to you. So I thought I'd start by explaining what it's not. A friend of ours uh, works in, uh, in Melton and she has to walk across a park from the school where she works to get home. One night she's coming home from school and then she has to go through the park and then into a, a jitty or an entry or a, whatever you might call it. And um, out of the other end, she's in her street. As she turned into this jitty, somebody else turned in at the top end, which was a, a young person with a hoodie on and uh, tall and sinister looking and down uh, walking with the hood up. This friend of ours was struck by fear. What does she do? Does she go through the jitty and meet this person in the middle? Or does she turn back and run? Running wasn't an option for her. So she head down and walked along through this jitty. Absolutely petrified what's going to happen as I meet this hoodie coming towards me. And you can feel for her, can't you, in that situation? Nobody else around, narrow passageway. And just as they were about to pass each other, the hoodie looked towards her and said, Hello, Mum. <laughs> it was a daughter coming the other way. But the fear that she felt is not that fear of the Lord. She was absolutely petrified, and we shouldn't be petrified of the Lord. The fear of the Lord, I looked it up in the NIV Topical Bible, has pages of scripture references to the fear of the Lord used in the Bible. And, uh, well, the, one of them is uh, Proverbs 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. When we start to fear the Lord, we start to become wise. We start to know the world in its place. We start to know the way of salvation. And uh, Mary, in her song in Luke, refers to it. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. We're to fear the Lord. We're to understand the Lord. We're to be in reverence of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is recognizing who God is and what he has done and recognizing our own smallness and worshiping him. God is great. We are small. Recognize that and worship him. Let's fall down in reverence before him. Let's keep God in his right place. He is holy. We are sinful. But if we're Christians, we recognize that God has saved us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And it tells us in uh, 1 Peter that once we were nobodies, but if we are Christians, we are children of God. And what does a father do? 
loves his children. And so we can sit comfortably with the Lord. Fear of the Lord is understanding him, keeping him in his proper place, recognizing our proper place as well. So fear the Lord and to keep his commandments, his commands, his decrees, statutes that I am giving you today. Why did God give us commandments? Because he knows how to interfere in our lives? No. Is it because he wants to stifle all enjoyment in our lives? No. The best place to look, the answer is in Scripture. He tells us here in this, uh, the end of that section, at the end of verse 13, to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. God isn't out to destroy our enjoyment of life. God is giving us a boundary for our life that uh, is for our own good. God's law is perfection, and we are free within God's law to live our lives. I think I've mentioned the uh, example before, but I'll mention it again. The, the kings, Phil, Kate, Phil and Kate King, we support them. Uh, they're working for Wycliffe Bible Translators, and uh, we've supported them for a number of years. They were out in Papua New Guinea for many years, but they're back in Gloucester now in England, uh, still working for Wycliffe. And their lads, they lived on a compound on, in Papua New Guinea, where um, there was a, a fence around a, a big area, houses in there, but they lived in one of the houses. I think they bought their own house on the compound. Their lads, uh, Simeon and Joshua, were free to, to roam and they'd roam barefooted in the compound. And off they'd go, and eventually they, they'd come back home. When they came to England uh, for a, a, a break, for a furlough, whatever you call it, home assignment, they went to uh, the outwoods in Loughborough. These are big woods and a lovely area of uh, countryside. And uh, grandfather said to them, uh, that's not my uh, responsibility, it's somebody else's. <laughs> grandfather said to the two lads, let's see how far you can run. And so off the two lads went and they ran 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 and got completely lost in the outwards. I don't know whether the, the lads were scared, but grandfather was very scared because he'd set him off on this. With complete freedom, with no restraints, it's a very dangerous place, this world, isn't it? And God has set a boundary for us. Those lads were safe in the compound with its boundary, and they could enjoy life. Without boundaries to them, they were very unsafe. Yeah, let's live happily within the boundaries that God has set, because he's set it for our own good. So those are the outer brackets, if you like, of this section. Secondly, to walk in his ways, again in verse 12, and to serve the Lord in verse 13. To walk in his ways, his ways, the path that God has marked out for us, Read in uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the mar race marked out for us. It's an individual race. It's a race that's marked out for you and it's a race that is different that is marked out for me. And we shouldn't complain when somebody's race is different to our race and their path is, happens to be smoother than our path. We shouldn't complain. We need to stick to the path that God has marked out for us. It's a holy race as well. It says there in Hebrews, throwing off sin. It's a holy race. Run with purpose. 
Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And as we run or walk, as it says in Deuteronomy, we are serving the Lord our God. Verse 13, in the process. Serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. We have a choice in life, don't we, as to who we serve. Joshua, in uh, uh, his leadership of the children of Israel, he led them into the promised land. Moses didn't. Joshua did. After he'd settled the people there, he spoke to the people about what they should be doing. They needed to make a choice. And Joshua says to them, now fear the Lord your God and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods, the idols, your forefathers worshipped beyond, beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But, says Joshua, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself who this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your forefathers beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. We have a choice as to who we serve in this life. Yeah, you're free to make a choice. But as Joshua said, I've made my mind up. I will serve the Lord. Whatever you folks do, you're not affecting me. I'm serving the Lord. And we need, don't we, ourselves to take that decision to serve the Lord. We'll have hard times in life. Maybe hard times at school. Maybe hard times at work. Maybe hard times at college, university. Even in our homes. Who are we going to serve? Joshua says, I'm going to serve the Lord. And we should serve him as well. Obedience and service, total commitment to the Lord. And then finally, to love him, verse 12. The, cli uh, the climax, the peak, the punchline, whatever you want to call it, the pinnacle is to love him. In all that we do in this life, our service is in service of him because we love him. And love is a much misused word today, isn't it? But in its true sense, it's something extremely deep. It's not selfish. What can I get out of this? No, it's reaching out to the other person. Love is the cement, the glue between any relationship. In uh, the greatest of attributes in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13, it says there now, these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. We love because God first loved us. We read in 1 John chapter 4. He has taken the initiative with us. He first loved us that we might love him. It's not just an emotion. It's a, love is a very powerful emotion, yes, but it's not just an emotion. Love is a resolve. Who are you going to serve? I will serve the Lord, says Joshua. I've made my mind up, and you are not going to affect me, you people, says Joshua. It's a resolve, a commitment, a decision of heart, mind, and strength. So our love for God is the peak. It's the peak, it's the evidence of whether we are truly loved by God. Because we love because he first loved us. Is it the case with you? Is it the case with me? Yeah, it binds us together as a fellowship, fellowship of love for one another, because God first loved us as individuals. We're to walk in his way. We're to fear him. 
We're to keep his commandments. We're to walk in his way, serving him with all our hearts and with all our souls, with all our strength. So may God, at the outset of this new year, give us daily strength by his spirit to do what he says. And as a result, may you have a truly joyful new year. Amen. Let's uh, sing our, our final hymn.